Thanks, Daniel. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Awesome. Uh, just show of hands, who here has a Raspberry Pi at home? A lot of you. <laughs> first gen, awesome. I have a first gen also. <laughs> awesome. Um, how many's actually, who here has actually used it for something besides just plugging in and playing with it? OK. Fewer hands, but still a few hands. Um, sweet. So uh, again, my name is Heston. Um, I'm an engineering manager at Lyft. Um, I work on the Lyft.com team as well as the AMP team, which is that cool kind of glowy thing you see on the car dashboards. Um, today, I'm actually not going to be talking about anything Lyft related. Um, instead, it's a, a side project I've been working on for the past um, seven or eight months. Um, so we're going to build a doorbell today, uh, an Internet of Things doorbell. And uh, we're actually going to build a doorbell that calls my phone. Um, so I'm going to walk you through how I did this. Uh, we're actually going to go pretty deep on a few different topics. Uh, we're going to talk about Python, of course, because we're at a, a Python conference. Um, we're also going to talk about some hardware, um, and we're going to talk about a few problems that I ran into uh, and kind of where this thing is going. So before we jump into the, the how of this, um, and there's going to be a lot of how, so don't worry, um, we're going to talk about the why. And I feel like this is kind of important because uh, this is a side project, so I didn't have a ton of time. Um, and also, if we don't know why we're actually doing this, we could get seriously off course with a project like this. Um, it's a pretty huge space when you're dealing with Internet of Things. So um, indulge me for a second, but um, this is my son, Hayes, uh, and this is our dog over here, Layla. And they generally get along really well. Uh, Hayes is about eight months old, um, so you notice this project has been going on for about eight months. Um, it actually started when, when he was born. And um, Although they get along really well, you can't see it, but he's actually trying to ride her. Um, when, uh, when he's taking a nap and somebody rings the doorbell, Layla would bark wildly and she'd wake him up and he would start crying and then the whole house was upset. Um, and this happened a lot when he was really little because we're ordering takeout all the time and stuff like that. Um, so we started to live in fear of our doorbell. So um, I was thinking, what, what can we do about this? So the first option is we could make the dog not bark, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, that's actually really hard. I tried it. It's like a protective instinct. You can't really train that out of them. Um, so kind of give up on that. Second option, you can make the baby not cry. Uh, if anyone has had luck with this, come and talk to me afterwards. Again, really hard. Um, and the third option, we could make the doorbell not ring. So I'm a software engineer. This seems like a technical problem. Uh, finally, it seems like we're on the right track. So this was my first attempt at making the doorbell not ring. Uh, this is a, a three by five card. I just taped it over the doorbell. Um, you think this might work, but actually we started missing a lot of deliveries. Uh, you know, we're trying to get food and people are really confused, like uh, how, do, how do I get in touch with you? Um, and also sometimes people would just not read it or ignore it and just ring the doorbell anyway. So this was V1. Um, I think we can improve on it. Then I had this, this kind of insight, like what if the doorbell could actually call my phone? because I always have my phone with me, I can put it on silent mode, and then it doesn't make the dog go crazy. Um, so that's kind of where this project came from. Okay, so, aha, this exists. You can go on Amazon, you can buy one of these ring doorbells uh, off the shelf, and they just work. Um, so I thought about doing this. Um, you know, it, it would solve the problem, um, but there's a few reasons that I didn't want to just buy something off the shelf. So the first problem, it's a little bit expensive. You know, we just had a baby. There's a bunch of stuff going on. Um, I didn't want to just go and start buying a bunch of crazy technology. Um, not terribly expensive, but something to keep in mind. Uh, the second issue is we live in a multi-unit building. So uh, I just have kind of a, a personal pet peeve when I go to somebody's house, and there's like five doorbells on, and you don't know which one to press. And some of them say, don't ring this one. And, um, so I, I kind of wanted to use the existing button that was on our gate because it just makes sense. There's only two buttons on the gate for the neighbor and, and us. And then the third reason, um, the third problem, which is actually kind of the real, the real reason behind this, is I have a Raspberry Pi sitting in a, door, in a drawer somewhere, uh, and I've been looking for something to do with it, and this seemed like a perfect opportunity. So that's, that's kind of the real reason. Okay, so... When I started off, I said I'm a software engineer. Um, I took a semester of electrical engineering in college. Like, I have all the tools I need to solve this problem, right? It's feeling pretty confident at the beginning. Uh, in addition to that, um, this is how I learned to solder. This is a book from 1979 that a family friend gave to me when I was a kid. Um, you can, you know, learn to solder and make your own FM radio or whatever. Um, so I had all the tools I needed. So with that in mind, um, 
let's jump into the hardware. So we're going to deal with the hardware first because um, it was kind of the piece I was the most sketched out by. Like Python, I do that every day. Hardware, not so much. OK, so here's what we're working with. Um, on the left, we have a Raspberry Pi. I think this is a, a revision B. Um, and then we have this old doorbell here on the right. Uh, and we have to make these two things talk to each other. Um, they're designed in totally different eras, totally different technologies. How do we get them to talk to each other? So the Raspberry Pi has great documentation. You can go and you know, read up on it and find all the stats. Uh, the doorbell, not so much. <laughs> it's kind of this box on the wall. So we have to figure out how this thing works. So before we do that, we need to, we need to gear up. We need some tools. So this is a multimeter. Uh, this is actually the exact one I have at home from Radio Shack. Unfortunately, I don't think you can obtain this anymore, but there are similar ones on the internet. Um, a multimeter is really useful because it tells you things about your circuit, like the voltage, the current, whether or not something is going to kill you, or whether or not if you plug something into something else, it's going to explode because the voltage is really, really high. Uh, it'll tell you if, for example, you're dealing with mains voltage, like 120 volts AC, or if you're dealing with something safer, like 5 volts DC. Um, so a very important tool. Uh, the next tool of the Tinker Trade is a breadboard. So uh, that's kind of this little white square plastic thing. These are jumper wires. Uh, there's a few components on this particular one. These are really inexpensive, and it lets you kind of prototype your hardware in a very safe way because you're not going to short out. You don't have to solder things. So you can change the connections if you need. Um, really, really useful. And then, of course, we need the internet. Uh, you know, pretty much everything computer electronics related is somewhere buried in some form on the internet. So uh, obviously we need that. And just to be safe, we're going to keep a fire extinguisher just within reach. Uh, we'll get into why that's important in a minute. <laughs> it is important. OK, so uh, I use these tools. Um, I actually took my doorbell apart. I used the multimeter, and I poked at it. And uh, I made some discoveries. So what do we learn? So the first thing is this wired doorbell uh, is 16 to 24 volts. It kind of varies depending on a number of conditions. But on the side of that transformer is stamped 16 volts, so we're going to go with that. Um, your system at home may be a little bit different, um, so don't take this as gospel. But uh, it's, you know, most doorbells are in these specs. Uh, it's AC current, which is important, alternating current. Um, and it's also, uh, when this thing is activated, it draws about an amp, 1,000 milliamps of power. Um, not a huge amount, but it's worth noting. Uh, so once I pull the cover off of the actual chime, this is what it looks like inside. Um, so the first thing we notice is there's this pin. This is called a solenoid. Uh, and when um, most of it's actually behind that little uh, that square in the middle. But when this thing gets activated, it can make the pin go up and down. Um, so when power is connected, the solenoid activates. The pin shoots down. Uh, and then it's going to hit this metal plate. There's like a metal plate here, if you can see it. That makes a really loud ding sound. Then when the power is disconnected, because you release the button, uh, there's a spring. The spring is kind of around the pin there. The spring pushes the pin back up to the top. And then the pin strikes another plate on the top. And that makes a dong sound. And that's how a mechanical doorbell works. So I pulled the cover off this thing. I actually saw it working. Um, again, surprisingly hard to find this on the internet. Um, and I took the time to actually draw this out into a schematic because I thought it was useful to just have some documentation. But this is um, kind of the representation of that system. So we have 120 volts. That is what's coming out of your, your uh, outlet. Then there is a 16-volt AC transformer. We saw a picture of that before. Then there's this chime solenoid here that goes up and down. Um, and then there's this button. And the button's kind of interesting um, because there's actually an incandescent light bulb, which is the kind of the squiggly thing um, between pins one and two. Uh, and then there's also a switch. So when the doorbell is not engaged, there is an incandescent bulb in there, and it glows so that you can see the button at night. Then when you push the button, it shorts out the light bulb, and then it connects the circuit. So the light bulb acts like a resistor um, and actually prevents enough current from flowing through so that the doorbell doesn't activate. But there's actually current flowing through it the whole time. Um, and then when you press the button, the resistor is taken out of the circuit. A lot more current flows, and then it can actually activate the solenoid. So, that is the circuit for our doorbell. Um, I guess I put these numbers in that I didn't use. So we're done, right? We figured out how the doorbell works. Uh, not quite, because we haven't actually hooked it up to the Raspberry Pi. So based on the specs uh, you can find online for Raspberry Pi, um, this thing is about 3.3 volts for the GPIO. It's direct current, DC, uh, and it's very, very small current, 5 milliamps. Uh, 
even less than that is kind of preferred. Um, so I mentioned GPIO. Uh, how many people know what GPIO is? A few people. Cool. So we'll talk about that for a sec. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output. Um, there's this row of pins or headers. Uh, this is on the model that I have, which is a, a Pi B. The new version of the Raspberry Pi actually has a lot more of these pins, um, but the, the first 26 of them or so are exactly the same, so they work the same way. So we have uh, the ones with numbers on them. These are actually the GPIO pins. Then we have some ground pins. We have these kind of 3.3 volt pins, and we have some 5 volt pins. Um, so the, the yellow ones are the ones we're interested in right now. They can actually be configured for input or output. So if they're configured for input, we can use it to detect if a current is turned on or if a current is turned off. And in output mode, the pin can actually provide current or stop providing current, kind of like a switch. Um, and the 5 volt pins, um, interesting note, those come directly from your USB power supply. So whatever you have plugged into the wall, um, that's what you'll get on those 5 volt pins. So in my case, I used a pretty beefy 2.4 amp power supply like you get on some of the more modern phones. Um, they're pretty inexpensive. Okay, so I spent the last few minutes talking about hardware. You know, finally let's dive into some of the Python code. So when we're talking about GPIO, we wanna know how we can control these things from software. Um, so I'm using this library called GPIO0. Um, it's an amazing library, I highly recommend it. Um, this is literally all the code we need to read a GPIO pin um, in terms of a button press. So we import button from GPIO0. We um, initialize it with pin 17. That's just, you know, if we go back a couple slides, you'll see that was just the pin labeled 17. Um, and then we can set up this callback. So I can say doorbell when pressed equals some function. And then whenever that button, whenever that pin is activated, it'll call that function. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so GPIO0 is, is really awesome. You can check it out, um, gpio0.readthedocs.io. Um, their kind of one-liner is it's a frictionless way to get started with physical computing, and it really is because it's so simple. Um, and the best part is it's already installed in uh, the most current version of Raspbian, which is the Raspberry Pi operating system. So you don't even have to install it. It's ready for you already. Okay, so software at this point is still pretty light, so we're going to go back to the hardware for a minute. Um, and figure out how to hook our doorbell and our Raspberry Pi together. So as I mentioned, we have these specs, 3.3 volts, DC, 5 milliamps. Uh, we also have our doorbell, which is 16 volts, AC, 1 amp. These things are totally incompatible. You can't just plug them in. Um, that kind of current is going to make your Raspberry Pi explode. Um, so don't, don't do that. So we need to build some sort of adapter between these two systems. Uh, you know, we need to get the signal from the doorbell into the Raspberry Pi. So my solution, which is a somewhat naive solution, is we're going to use an electromechanical relay. Um, there are solid state ways to do this, but it's, they're kind of complicated in the interest of time. I just bought one of these guys. Um, this is kind of a cool device. There's a coil. I have a little diagram here. Um, when you activate that coil, you have this, uh, this armature thing, and it, it'll kind of click, and it'll connect another switch. So you can use one current to activate a switch to connect another circuit. Um, so I mentioned there's some solid state ways to do this. It gets a little bit complicated because you're actually switching uh, a, a pretty high current AC signal. Um, so I just, you know, it exceeded my, my one semester of, of EECS experience. Um, but this works really well. So uh, in, the, in the title of the talk, I promised you fire. Uh, I also mentioned there's a fire extinguisher. So we're going to talk into um, my first pass at hooking all this stuff together. Um, there, it, spoiler alert, there wasn't actually a fire, but there was a lot of smoke, and it was kind of scary. Okay, so um, before we can talk about why things caught fire, there's, I have to get into a little bit of math, so I, I apologize if uh, you're not a math buff, but um, we'll go through it kind of quickly. So the relays uh, that you buy, so that electric mechanical relay, they come in discrete coil voltages. So 6 volts AC, 12 volts, 24 volts AC. Um, those are generally what you can get off the shelf. None of those, as you notice, are 16 volts. So you might be able to use one of them with 16 volts. Uh, the 24 volt one, for instance, may not activate at 16 volts. The 12 volt one probably will activate, but if you use it a lot, you might burn out the coil. So we need to bring our 16 volt circuit either up or down uh, to work with our relay. So we're going to target this, the 12 volt relay. This is one of the simplest electronic circuits. Um, you can, it's kind of like electronics 101. This is called the voltage divider. And we basically have two resistors, R1 and R2. We have a source voltage, which is 16 volts, which is our transformer. 
and then we're going to tap in between the two resistors, and we're going to get an output voltage that is proportional to the two resistor values. It's called the voltage divider because you divide the voltage between those two resistors. But how do we pick the values of those resistors? Um, this is a, a, an equation. It's not terribly complicated, but it's basically saying that our output voltage is going to be uh, proportional to our input voltage times R2, and inversely proportional times the uh, to the total volt or resistance of the system. So that's R1 plus R2. Um, again, this is something you can Google if you're interested in voltage dividers. Um, I recommend looking into it. So in this case, we're going to assume that our uh, source voltage, which is Vs, which is the 16 volts, is not going to is not going to change. But in reality, if you're doing this at home, you should go and measure it and make sure because these transformers tend to have a little bit of uh, variance. So what I did is I fired up Google Sheets. I took that equation I just showed you and I plugged it into one of the cells. Um, and then on the x-axis here, which is R1, I just picked random values going up by 10 ohms. And then on the y-axis, um, I did the same thing. And then I just filled all the cells in between, which gave me the output voltage based on those two resistors. Um, and then for fun, I just color-coded it. So if it's red, that means the voltage is too high. We're probably going to burn something out. If it's yellow, that means the voltage is too low. And we're probably not going to be able to activate the relay. And then the green is everything that's kind of within specs for the relay. So my first pass at this is I just kind of picked something on the low end arbitrarily. I was like 30 and 60. You know, they're kind of even numbers. Looks really good. Um, and I wired all this stuff up. So there's a, a second piece of this, which I hadn't considered it f at first. But um, this is Ohm's Law. Who, has anyone here heard of Ohm's Law? OK, awesome. Bunch of people. Uh, it's a pretty simple relationship between current, voltage, and resistance. So the idea is that if you have any two of these, if you have the voltage and resistance, or the current and the voltage, you can figure out the other third one. So as I mentioned, I just looked at the kind of simple resistance values in the first case, and I hadn't considered the current that would be allowed to pass through the system based on those resistors. Uh, so this is the table um, when we look at Ohm's law compared with those resistance values, um, and we map um, you know, the red would be if the current is way too high for the, the relay, and the green is if the current is okay. So based on the resistor values I picked, it turns out that um, we're going to allow about a third of an amp through our resistor network. Um, again, I didn't do this at first. This is something I did afterwards. So uh, these are the resistors that I picked. Uh, they can dissipate about a half a watt each, which, you know, didn't really mean much to me at the beginning. I'm like, yeah, sure, these are, these are resistors. They're all the same. Uh, what this means is if you put much more than half a watt through them, they burn up. They release a lot of smoke. Um, it's kind of scary. It smells really bad. So again, um, the values I picked mean that we're putting way, way too much current into our resistor network. We're actually putting 4.8 watts through our resistors that can handle half a watt. So what, what do you think happened when I powered this thing on? Yes, fire. Actually, it wasn't fire. These things are kind of fireproof. But there was a lot of smoke, and it smelled really bad, and I was kind of scared, and I unplugged everything really fast. Um, so the moral of this story is always double check your math. Just make sure you didn't transpose something. Uh, I could have bought resistors with higher value. They're not that much more expensive. They're equally available. Um, or I could have just selected higher resistances, and that would have solved the problem also. And kind of the, the second piece, the pro tip, is just buy extra of everything. This stuff is super cheap. A resistor is like a few cents, so just buy dozens of them. Uh, the shipping for one order, uh, I think I use mouse or electronics for this stuff. The shipping is like five bucks per order, and the resistors are 10 cents. So just buy a lot of them. OK, so if you didn't follow all that, that's OK. Uh, the moral of the story is uh, buy resistors that can dissipate like three to five watts. You'll be OK. They're a little bit bigger, but they're fine. OK, so that was a bit of a tangent off into math land, but um, we're going to come back now. And we're actually going to try to call my phone. Um, so at this point, we have a system. We have a relay hooked up. Um, the doorbell can activate the relay. That connects to a GPIO pin. The GPIO pin has some code that can call a function that's running somewhere on the Raspberry Pi. Um, now we need to figure out what that function is going to do. So um, this is the code that's going to call my phone. Um, so uh, in this case, I decided to use Twilio. Um, they're, it's super easy to set up. They have great libraries for a bunch of different languages. It's really easy to install. Um, they have really great developer documentation, so, uh, and I've used them before, so I thought this would be relatively straightforward. So um, I'm just going to import client from twilio.rest. Uh, I have a settings file. It's just a bunch of constants with 
my phone number or the from number I set up in the Twilio console, uh, account credentials, things like that. Um, then I'm going to define a function called notify. That's just going to create a new call. It says client.calls.create. Uh, we're going to call my phone number from my from number. Um, this URL is going to be uh, uh, a URL that points to a Twimmel file. We'll talk about that in a little minute, what's in that. Um, I don't want to leave a message because it's really annoying every time the doorbell calls for it to leave a message on your phone. Um, and then finally, we're going to do call.fetch, which is actually going to make the request to Twilio, and then Twilio is going to call my phone. So this is all the code that we need to um, have the Raspberry Pi uh, trigger a phone call. So finally, we have the phone piece, we have the GPIO piece, we can wire it all together. Are you excited? <laughs> awesome. So this is what we have. We have our notify function. We have our GPIO zero code. We can say doorbell.whenpressed equals notify. It's really not that much code. This will result in uh, my phone ringing, hopefully, whenever the doorbell is being pressed. Um, so I mentioned uh, a minute ago that there's a little bit more code than this. There's the Twimmel that we need to serve to Twilio, which will tell Twilio how to behave with the, the voice network. Um, and this is what the Twimmel looks like. Uh, it's basically XML. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so what this will do, the response will say, ding dong, this is your doorbell calling. Someone is at the door. Um, so if I decide to pick up the phone, that's what I'm going to hear. So the moment of truth. Does it work? So hopefully this video will play on our uh, network here. So I'm pressing the doorbell. Here's my phone. And it works. <laughs> cool. So that was like kind of a, my first uh, attempt at doing this, and it, it worked. I was super excited. Uh, on the success of this, I was thinking, well, what else, what else can this thing do? Plus, I wanted to write some more code. That wasn't a lot of Python code. We spent most of our time lighting resistors on fire. So when I was playing around with the doorbell testing it, I noticed this guy inside of the gate, um, this kind of gold looking thing. This is called a strike. Um, basically what it is, there's another solenoid inside of there. Uh, there's a button inside of the house. When you push the button, this thing buzzes, and then you can pull open the gate. Um, so uh, again, for clarification, it's just that little piece. It's not actually the button. They're two separate things. So I was thinking, what if I could open the gate from my phone? How cool would that be? So this kind of became my obsession, uh, thinking about like, how we could make these things work together. So kind of back to the drawing board, took out my tinker tools, uh, poked around at this gate strike. Um, it turns out it's very similar to the doorbell itself. It has this uh, transformer, 16 volts, AC. Takes about an amp to activate the gate strike. Very, very similar to the chime. Um, this was actually a little bit easier to discover because there's a sticker on the side of that thing that says all these things on it. So it gave me a little more confidence. OK, but now I was faced with a couple problems. I know how it works, but how do we activate it? You know, there's a button inside of the house. Um, it's not like I'm detecting a button press. I have to actually turn this thing on. Um, so we need a GPIO pin to actually connect a circuit. Um, and I had to dive back into the hardware. So we're going to talk about hardware again. This is the kind of the T part of the Internet of Things. Um, it's pretty important. Um, so again, here's our GPIO. Um, I put a few annotations here. So uh, it turns out that the GPIO pins, they're 3.3 volts. Um, the maximum current that you can pull from them is about 15 milliamps. Um, so not, not, not a ton. And I really don't recommend that much because that's kind of the, the upper maximum. Um, and then I mentioned that my 5 volt supply is hooked up to a 2.4 amp um, USB kind of plug thing. So I don't want to fry my Pi. I'm going to stay away from 50 milliamps. But now I have a problem um, because I'm going uh, to use relays again because relays worked so well the last time. Uh, these are kind of the smallest relays that I could find. They need 5 volts DC, and they require 80 milliamps of current to activate. So I can't dr uh, drive them directly from the GPIO. Not enough voltage, not enough current. Um, yeah, they're just not compatible. So here's the solution I came up with. We're going to use transistors. So finally, a little bit of solid state technology. Uh, a transistor is a pretty awesome device. Um, you know, they're everywhere. Hopefully you guys know what a transistor is. Um, so what we have here is uh, three pins. We have a base, which is the B. We have a 
collector, which is a C, and we have an emitter, which is an E. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the GPIO pin to put a small amount of voltage, a small amount of current on the base, and that's going to allow a much larger current and larger voltage to flow from the collector through the emitter. So it's basically a switch, but it's solid state, so there's nothing clicking. Um, so as an aside, I originally wanted to use some setup like this for the whole thing and just get rid of the, uh, the relays. Um, it turns out that's a little bit trickier because um, voltage or, or current can only flow one direction through a transistor, and I have an AC circuit, so you have to use a different device, and it just got a little complicated. Okay, so we're going to use a transistor. Um, here's a slightly more complicated schematic, but uh, not that much more. So we have our Raspberry Pi here. We have pin GPIO 17 hooked up to our transistor. Um, so that's, that's that one right there. Then when we turn on that pin, that pin is going to allow our five volts from the Raspberry Pi power supply, basically, to flow through the transistor. That's going to go through the relay coil. That's going to activate the relay. The relay is going to click, makes like an actual audible click sound, and that's going to connect our doorbell strike, and the gate will unlock, hopefully. Um, uh, so there's an awesome tool, by the way, if you see in the corner, Fritzing, you can download this thing for free online. Um, it lets you do these schematics and print them out, and it gives you parts lists and things like that. So that's our hardware design. Um, we're going to take a look at the code for how to activate this as well. So again, we're using GPIO0. Um, we're doing something a little bit different this time. So the uh, GPIO0 provides you with a number of simple devices like buttons and LEDs and whatnot. Um, they don't provide a gate strike component out of the box, but they do have this digital output device. So it's uh, kind of a, the base class for buttons and other things. So what I did is I simply subclass that. I defined a new method called release, because we're going to release the strike to open the gate. Um, and it turns out the digital output device has a method called blink. Uh, this allows you to blink an LED, turn something on and off. We're kind of abusing this. We're going to have it blink a single time. So it'll blink for some duration, say three seconds, and then it'll turn off. It'll do that exactly once, and that's how we're going to turn the gate on and then turn the gate off, turn the strike on and off. We're also going to do it in the background, so this is going to uh, run this code in a separate thread so that we don't end up blocking our main process the whole time the gate is unlocked, because we want to be able to respond to other events. So I instantiate this, uh, initialize it to pin equals 18, because um, 17 is already being used for our button. Um, and then I just define a really simple function. This just calls gatestrike.release. So anytime I call that, it should uh, activate pin 18, and hopefully should activate our gate strike. So we solve one problem, which is that we can unlock the gate, hopefully. Um, but we have a second problem. We actually have to know when to call this code. You know, we don't just want to call it every time somebody presses the button, because then our gate, it's not really a security system if you can just press a button and the gate always unlocks. Um, so we have to figure out uh, how to trigger this thing. Um, so it's worth at this point talking about uh, how the Raspberry Pi is talking to our network. Um, turns out outgoing network connections are super easy. So we saw that already. We made a request to Twilio. There's a little Wi-Fi dongle thing plugged into the USB port. It connects to the home Wi-Fi. Um, you can just make a request, and it works like you'd expect. That's because Twilio has a public IP address. They have a domain name. We know where to find them on the internet, and we can just request it. The flip side, though, is that incoming network connections are actually kind of hard. Uh, we have this device. It's sitting at home. It's behind a NAT firewall. It doesn't have a public IP address. It definitely doesn't have a domain name. So there's no good way to, uh, to kind of reach into the network and tell the Raspberry Pi to unlock the gate. So there's a few solutions to this. Uh, one is I could open a port in my firewall. Um, this would be relatively straightforward. Um, I really, really don't recommend this. Uh, I think one of the salient issues around Internet of Things is security, especially when you're dealing or uh, network security, but also physical security in the case of a doorbell. We wouldn't want an attacker to you know, hack into this thing and just be able to unlock my front gate. Um, that'd be kind of scary. Um, plus, they, that would let them into, the, into your home network. So um, that didn't really seem like, uh, like a safe solution. Second option is we could use some sort of proxy. So um, in my experience, I've used ngrok, which is pretty awesome. Uh, it has a service running in the cloud. The Raspberry Pi can connect to it, and then somebody on the internet can connect to the other end, and it'll proxy traffic um, across, your, across your firewall. Um, I was thinking about that at first. The problem is that it comes with a subscription, so I didn't really want to be paying a monthly fee to use my doorbell. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not much, but you know, it adds up over time. 
The third option here is we could pull a web app. I could launch something in the cloud, and I could just every second I could ask it, is the doorbell open, or is the gate open? Is the, should the gate be open? Should the gate be open? Should the gate be open? And then one out of a million times, it'll say yes, and I can unlock. Um, so this is kind of how we used to do things back in the day. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. The problem is it's really inefficient, because you're making a ton of network requests, and most of the time you don't care about them. This is especially important if you're uh, using a free tier of something like Firebase, and um, you actually have a certain number of requests, uh, a certain number of traffic you can pass before they start charging you. So I didn't want to, again, get charged for this. Um, so I thought we could do better than that. Fourth option um, is a technology called server sent events. Uh, this is sort of similar to long polling or Comet, to those of you who have uh, done web development. Um, and it's a little bit better than polling because we have one persistent connection, and then the server can push data over that connection whenever something changes. Um, so it's much more efficient than polling. Uh, it turns out that the Firebase real-time database provided by Google actually has an API to do this, um, which is pretty cool. Firebase also has a free tier. They have a lot of developer documentation, so I thought I would give that a try. Um, the one downside is that you need to use uh, JavaScript to write your server code, but that's okay. So here is how, how our database looks. It's kind of like um, NoSQL, uh, so you have a JSON document. We're going to represent the strike with a zero. That means that the gate is locked. Um, and the flow is going to be that the Raspberry Pi makes a request to Twilio. Twilio is going to call my phone. We already covered how that works. The new piece is that my phone is going to send something back to Twilio. Twilio is going to make a request to a Firebase cloud function. And the cloud function is going to update the Firebase real-time database. Once that happens, we're going to set this value to 1. That's going to indicate that the gate should be unlocked. So Firebase, when it sees that change, it's going to push the data down to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi has an event listener that's going to get called. It'll say, ah, the gate turned to a 1. It'll unlock the gate. And then as soon as that's done, it'll set the value back to zero and update Firebase again. So that's kind of how we're, we're doing this, this asynchronous um, loop here. So now our gate is locked again. We're back to our original state. So let's take, it, take a look at some of the code for this. Um, so we're going to look at the Python side, how the Raspberry Pi is talking to uh, Firebase. Um, so we're going to instantiate a connection to our database. And then this line at the bottom just says, uh, get setting slash strike, and then stream changes from that to a function called on strike changed. So whenever the data changes, we're going to call that method. Um, I'm using a library called Pyrebase. Uh, it is, um, there's a few libraries out there. You actually don't even need a library. There's just a nice REST interface to, uh, to Firebase, but um, this one seemed like the most well-developed. It had good documentation, um, so I just went with this. Um, you do have to install it. It only works on Python 3. Um, so if you want to use it on Python 2, then um, there's some other options. But um, this is what I went with. So again, here is our simple code. And then we'll fill out uh, our onStrike changed method. So um, very straightforward. We're going to get past the value into our callback. We're going to say, if the value is 1, let's unlock the gate. And then let's reset the database. Uh, so opening the gate calls that GPIO code that I showed you a few slides back. It's going to call gatestrike.release. And then reset gate simply sets our setting strike value back to zero. So fairly, fairly straightforward here. Again, doesn't work. Uh, question in the back? Uh, the question is, how long will the gate stay open? So that's configurable based on, uh, there's a few slides ago where I had the GPIO code up. Um, you can configure the duration of the, the quote, blink. Um, so I think I had it set to three seconds, but you could make it whatever you want. Um, it's a setting, though, on the Raspberry Pi, so it's not, it's not configurable in real time. But you could, you could do that if you wanted. Does it work? Time for another demo. OK, so the doorbell has called me. And now I'm going to press any key, in this case, 5. And you can't hear the sound, but the thing is actually buzzing. Can't really hear it. And the gate opened. Success. Uh, so this got me thinking, OK, so we proved that this thing can actually work end to end. Um, but does it really work? What I mean by that is, does it work so well that I don't have to think about it anymore? Does it, is, it, is it reliable is really what I'm getting at. Um, so there's a number of ways to test this. Uh, my approach, since I was the only one using it, is just set it up and see what happens. Uh, let, it, let it sit there. So after a couple days, I saw a couple of problems. The first one was I got random phantom rings in the night. Um, this was kind of creepy. 
Um, very annoying because the phone would just ring repeatedly at like 9 p.m. every night. It was, it was just maddening. Um, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I thought it could be software. Uh, I combed through all the software. I actually wrote unit tests for everything. Um, looked fine, you know, not that, much, not that much code. Didn't appear to be the software. What I discovered is that we're interfacing to an analog circuit, and these things are pretty noisy. So maybe the current fluctuates. Uh, I had one theory that at a certain point in the evening when the sun set, the, the actual button would cool off a little bit and the resistance and the light bulb would go down and that was allowed a little bit more current to go through that would trigger the relay. Um, I don't know exactly what the cause was, but this was kind of my hunch. Um, so this was the code I had, uh, pin 17, when pressed, notify. What this will actually do is uh, any time that pin sees any change, even if it's a change for just a millisecond, it'll call that callback and it'll call me. Um, it turns out that humans, when they press a doorbell, they tend to press it for like half a second or something, um, not one millisecond. Uh, GPIO has a way to, to handle this. Um, they have a hold time, and then there's a separate method. Instead of when pressed, we can call when held. So I added this, which means that you know, don't call the callback unless the pin is activated for more than, in this case, 300 milliseconds. It's almost imperceptible to a person, but it makes a big difference when you're trying to do noise rejection. So with this change, um, it fixed the problem. No more phantom rings in the night. I was very excited. My wife was too, because she was, it was calling her phone and like she was getting very annoyed. But we had a second problem a couple days later that the doorbell just stopped working. You know, we were missing deliveries. People would call us saying, hey, I'm outside. Nobody's answering the door. Um, we missed a lot of Amazon deliveries, that sort of thing. And I discovered that uh, it was the latency. So, um, I mentioned there's a whole bunch of moving pieces. There's Twilio, and there's Firebase, and there's cloud functions, and we're calling out from a network, and there's, I'm on a home Wi-Fi network, and um, there's just a lot of latency built into this system. So Twilio, all the round trips there, sometimes can add up to a few seconds. Firebase, uh, cloud functions get ejected from memory so that you have to kind of load them back into memory. That can take a few seconds. Um, and actually just calling my phone, going out over the cell network and establishing a connection to my cell phone takes a few seconds. Um, so we could replace Firebase with Python, try to solve the Firebase problem. Um, this might help, right? We're at a Python conference, so it seemed like a good idea. Um, but that only solves one of our problems. It doesn't actually solve the whole latency issue. It's just that one piece. Um, option two was we could write a native app. So this would be something that lives on my phone, and then we can use push notifications to trigger the app. And then we cut out Twilio, and we cut out all this other stuff. Um, so this actually seems like the direction I want to go with it. I haven't had an opportunity to do that yet, but um, if anyone is interested, um, I would love some help on the project. So the doorbell doesn't ring. It's, uh, it's kind of an ongoing thing. It's, you know, the solution is still pending. It mostly works, but every once in a while you get like a timeout or something just doesn't happen in a timely manner. So again, I'd love help on that one. Um, and the third problem, or the, sorry, the, the second problem here, that seems like the third problem, but uh, the gate sometimes wouldn't open, so I'd press 5 or whatever, and it would tell me that it was opening, and then it didn't actually do anything. So what I, what I saw from the logs, I had a lot of logging coming through the system, is that the Firebase connection would just drop. You know, we have a single, kind of long-pulled connection to the database. Every once in a while, maybe it was the Wi-Fi that would go out, um, the connection would terminate. So my solution here was to create a health check on a timer that ran in a separate thread. So we're using the timer class here. Um, every 30 minutes, it's going to wake up and it's going to check and be like, hey, is my data stale? Um, the staleness, uh, there's a function here that says should update. Um, so was this a long time ago? Like two hours ago was the last time I saw data from Firebase. If so, it's probably the connection got dropped. And then we have an update function. This is just going to reestablish our Firebase connection. So it runs every 30 minutes. Um, pretty naive, but um, it actually solved the problem. Um, we now had a health check that could reestablish our connection. So, at the end of all this, we had a mostly working system, um, so I would consider it a, su a success. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like mounted in my closet. <laughs> my wife mentioned it looks like a bomb. Um, <laughs> so, I think in a, in a future version, we'd actually want to get this onto like an integrated circuit and solder it together, but um, this, is, this is the way the prototype looks. A lot of wires, uh, but nothing caught fire, so that's good. So uh, to recap, we did a lot of things. We identified a problem that we wanted to solve. We gathered empirical information. We used our multimeter. Uh, we designed a hardware circuit. We actually designed a few hardware circuits. We put out a fire, almost. We averted disaster. 
um, we did some math to figure out what would prevent the fire in the first place. Um, we learned how the Raspberry Pi's GPIO works, we learned about Twilio, we learned about Firebase, we hooked all these things together, we did some QA, we dog fooded our own project, we fixed some bugs, and then at the end of it, uh, we had a cold, frosty beverage and celebrated success. So I learned a few lessons in the process. First one is that hardware is hard. Um, you know, yeah, you make mistakes, it has real consequences, so tackle this first in your own projects. Um, kind of a corollary of this is that um, the real world has laws of physics. If you exceed the current requirement or, or ratings for your devices, they will burn out. Um, in software, you can just try again. In hardware, you have to go buy new stuff. Um, so it's worth keeping in mind. And kind of the last piece is that physical computing is within reach, like really inexpensive. A Raspberry Pi is $25. These components I mentioned are a few cents. Uh, the actual parts are very easy to obtain and very easy to put together. Um, I think this is pretty awesome when you think about where computing has come, the cost of cell phones even. Um, these things are really inexpensive. Um, there's also amazing free tools. Everything that I used here was open source or had a free tier if it was a hosted platform. Um, this is, I think, pretty incredible that we can build on top of all this great work. I mentioned GPO0 and Pyrebase. These are, these are great libraries and they're free to the community. So um, in light of that, um, so I've open sourced the code for this. Uh, you can check it out on my GitHub. Um, it's, uh, there's actually a lot more in that code base than I went over today. There's actually a voice-powered admin interface so you can register new phone numbers, you can unregister numbers. Um, it supports multiple units, so our neighbors saw this and wanted to get in on it, so I added a whole separate circuit for their doorbell, but it's all powered by the same Raspberry Pi. Um, and it's uh, you know, kind of freely available, free to use it, and check it out. Um, I welcome pull requests, so if anyone is interested in contributing, especially with the native app side, I would love your help. So with that, go out there and build your own whatever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Oh, many. <laughs> um, mine's kind of a two-part question. The first one is, where physically did you have to connect these? Was the Raspberry Pi and everything, you said it was in the closet, was it connected to the inside part of your doorbell? And then um, for the gate opening part, was it connected to the gate? Like, I, don't under, I guess yeah. I just don't understand where you physically connected it. And mm -hmm. the second part of the question is, is there a reason you chose to do a phone call instead of um, like a text message? Yeah, so um, those are good questions. So uh, I kind of cut out the piece where I actually hooked everything up to the existing system because honestly it was me in the garage uh, with a headlamp on, crawling through a bunch of dusty spaces trying to find the wiring that came from the door and the wiring that came from the bell. And I used the multimeter to try to figure out where that stuff was. Um, so the wiring did actually come up into our closet, which is very convenient. And then we had the chime mounted on the outside wall. So I actually knew where the wiring came up through the house. I just had to verify which wire went to what. Um, and then I snipped off the existing doorbell and then wired it into my, my new system. Um, so, you know, depending on your setup at home, this stuff may be hidden inside of walls. So it'll take a little bit of digging. Um, and the second piece was, uh, why not a text message? Um, the reason was around latency. I mentioned that that's kind of a problem currently, but a text message, uh, potentially these things are delayed several minutes, so I didn't want to know two minutes later when the doorbell had been rung. Um, so I thought a call would be a little bit more real time. Anyone else? <laughs> 